Tonight, the last stops on former President Trump's revenge tour. Wyoming Congresswoman and fierce Trump critic Liz Cheney now expected to lose her primary after taking that leading role on the January 6th committee. And in Alaska, Senator Lisa Murkowski, who voted to convict Trump in his second impeachment trial, also fighting to keep her job. This as former vice presidential nominee and trump back candidate Sarah Palin could win the state's sole House seat. We have teams on the ground in both states with new reporting. Also, top secret trail. Trump's former national security advisor speaking exclusively to NBC News, sharing new clues into how those classified documents may have ended up at Mar-a-Lago. This as many in Trump's inner circle are interviewed by the FBI. And tonight, how Trump's passports got mixed into all of this. Ukraine on the attack, explosions rocking an ammunition depot in Russia-controlled Crimea. Putin now blaming the U.S. for fueling the war by providing weapons to Ukraine. And our Josh Letterman in Ukraine speaking to retired Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Vindman, who was at the center of Trump's first impeachment. His message for President Biden and tonight why he's in that country. Mob ties, bodies, including two in barrels, discovered in Lake Mead as water levels drop. Could the grisly discoveries be connected to Sin City's infamous mafia history? Plus, Summer of the Shark, a 10-year-old bitten while snorkeling and losing his leg. So are attacks on the rise? Conservationist and TV host Jeff Corwin joins Top Story tonight. And Rollover Rescue, the incredible moment a group of strangers came together to rescue a driver after his car flipped over. Top Story starts right now. And good evening. A big night of politics. Can anti-Trump GOPers keep their seats in Congress? Those primary tests tonight and what it could mean for the future of the Republican Party. The once high-ranking Republican and daughter of a vice president, Representative Liz Cheney, is bracing for a loss to her Trump-backed challenger in Wyoming. A reminder, that state the former president won by the largest margin in 2020. Not only has she been a fierce critic of the former president and voted to impeach him, but she also helps lead the housing, the House committee investigating January 6th. And another state we're watching, Alaska, where Senator Lisa Murkowski is fighting to save her seat. She also voted to convict Trump in his second impeachment trial and moments ago telling our Ali Vitale, quote, I hope that we do not become the party of Donald Trump. Meanwhile, a Trump-backed candidate, former vice presidential nominee, is trying to stage a political comeback and be Alaska's sole House member. Does she have the support of voters there after resigning as the state's governor? We have teams in both states tonight, but we begin with Vaughn Hilliard in Wyoming. In Wyoming today, voters will decide the political fate of Congresswoman Liz Cheney and maybe help shape the future of the Republican Party. You guys have known Cheney for yeah, he years. Yeah, has a house across the street. I here. talked to them in the grocery store. And yet you voted for? Harriet. Yeah. As of November 8th, we're taking our country back. Trump endorsed Republican Harriet Hageman, trying to oust Cheney, who put her political career on the line by voting to impeach President Trump and then agreeing to serve as vice chair on the January 6th Select Committee. Here in Wyoming... Harriet Hageman or Liz Cheney? Oh, thank hey, you. Hey, A party solidifying around the former president. Liz Cheney hates the voters of the Republican Party. Cheney hoping Democrats like Dorothy Stout can help, who switched parties today. She's the only person fighting in the Republican Party, and we have to vote for her. The evolution of the GOP over the last 20 years is striking, and that's why it's not just Wyoming where Trump looms large today. I'm Ali Vitale in Alaska. Voters here considering Trump allies and detractors alike on their ballots today using a new system of ranked choice voting for the first time. Conservative firebrand Sarah Palin vying for a comeback, up for an open house seat and relying on her well-known name and Trump's endorsement. You're going to send the great, legendary Sarah Palin to the U.S. House of Representatives. We cannot afford any more D's or rhinos in office or we get less freedom. Palin consistent. We just need to drill, baby, drill. But her win's not guaranteed. And on the Senate side, Senator Lisa Murkowski facing headwinds to keep her seat as one of Trump's top targets. She's by far the worst. My campaign is not about Donald Trump. Murkowski expected to survive this primary round. 
All right, Ali Vitali and Vaughn Hillier join us now live from the campaign trail. Ali, I want to start with you. I know you're in Anchorage. We, we reported that you recently spoke with Senator Murkowski just moments ago. I know you asked her about where she fits into the Republican Party. I did ask that question, and it felt like the right one, especially given the way that she has acted towards the former president over the course of the last few years, and even during his tenure in Washington. She's someone who voted to convict him of impeachment charges. Certainly, that's one of the reasons why she's one of Trump's top targets in these midterms. But her answer was that she hoped that the Republican Party would not become the party of one person. I countered, of course, Tom, with the fact that it felt like it was. And Murkowski's answer was, if the Republican Party continues to go down this road, she thinks that they're going to lose a lot of could-be Republican voters because they're not necessarily voters who are all in the mold of Donald Trump. Certainly, Murkowski isn't. All right, Ali, while I have you, I do want to ask you one quick follow-up, though, on Sarah Palin. You've been talking to voters down there. What are her chances yeah. looking like? Well, look, her national appeal, Tom, is both a sell and something that could cut against her because her opponents are seizing on the fact that during this campaign season, she has spent time campaigning everywhere else but Alaska, it seems, at least the way that they tell that story. Her national name ID is something that she's leaning on here. But look, voters in this state want someone who can speak to Alaska issues. It's entirely possible that Palin's national profile might make her too national in the eyes of voters, too. Her win here, not necessarily assured at all. All right, Ali, we thank you for your reporting. Vaughn, you're next up. You're in Wilson, Wyoming, live for us tonight. You know, I have to, I want to read you something from, from NBCnews.com. This is from our, our colleague, Jonathan Allen. He writes, locals say she has appeared in public a few times talking about Liz Cheney. No public events scheduled over the weekend or on Monday. So, Vaughn, I, I have to ask you, was this a campaign strategy or did she sort of know the inevitable? You know, it's still kind of an outstanding question, to be honest there, Tom. The campaign is not commenting on any potential security issues which have been suggested may have been the case for her not having these public appearances. We should note that for the better part of more than a year now, she had, has had a special Capitol Police detail follow alongside of her. And the only members of Congress who get that special detail are those who have had credible threats made against them. At the same time, there was months ago that campaign allies were making the case to me that they believe that Liz Cheney would be able to change the the opinions of so many Republican voters, including those here in Wyoming, through those January 6th public hearings, a national stage, national TV, and would be able to, including right here in her own backyard, be able to bring over some of those Republicans and convince them that her fight against Donald Trump, an effort to bring justice in the aftermath of the January 6th insurrection, would lead voters to ultimately back her. Ultimately, we'll find that out tonight. Tom? And Vaughn, while I have you, I know you've been covering the former president's influence on the party over the last last year. As we reach now the end of this primary season, have you seen any change at all with the way Republican voters view former President Trump? You know, time after time, after investigation, after this Mar-a-Lago raid, we have seen voters continue to stick by these Trump-backed candidates. It was just a week ago in Wisconsin, literally 24 hours after that Mar-a-Lago search warrant was executed, where his favorite candidate for governor in Wisconsin won. And yet again, today is going to be another one of those tests. And really, Liz Cheney's race caps off a string of primaries over the last four or five months in which his record of endorsed candidates have performed quite well. Tom? Ali Vitali, Von Hilliard, live for us from the campaign trail and leading us off tonight here on Top Story with some terrific new reporting. Guys, we thank you. As Trump's influence is put to the test in these primaries, tonight we're learning more about the Justice Department's probe into his handling of classified documents. The former president now calling for the affidavit that led to the search at Mar-a-Lago to be released. But federal prosecutors warn that could jeopardize their investigation. NBC News senior White House correspondent Kelly O'Donnell reports. Tonight, unraveling secrets behind the Mar-a-Lago search. A tight circle of former Trump White House officials with direct knowledge of how the former president handled classified materials are among those interviewed by the FBI, according to the New York Times, including White House counsel Pat Cipollone, deputy counsel Patrick Philbin, who were named in this letter by President Trump as his representatives to the National Archives. Also interviewed, Derek Lyons, who as staff secretary managed all documents that reached the president. Witness testimony remains confidential as a new clash pits former President Trump against the Department of Justice. Thursday in Florida, a federal magistrate will consider unsealing more documents. 
The former president used social media to render his judgment. In the interest of transparency, I call for the immediate release of the completely unredacted affidavit. Federal prosecutors signaled they are open to releasing some materials, but not the affidavit. That explains probable cause, writing, the affidavit would serve as a roadmap to the government's ongoing investigation and would likely chill future cooperation by witnesses. But Mr. Trump's Republican allies are turning up the pressure. We need the affidavit. Show your cards. Uh, Merrick Garland can't have it both ways. He can't give us the inventory, the warrant, without telling us why it was necessary to raid the former president's home. Among more than two dozen boxes seized from Mar-a-Lago, three passports belonging to the former president, one expired, one current, and his diplomatic passport swept up in the search. Prosecutors alerted Mr. Trump's counsel the passports could be picked up at the Washington field office Monday. But later, the former president claimed the FBI stole them. Trump aides tell NBC News the passports have been retrieved. All right, Kelly O'Donnell joins us now from the White House. You know, Kelly, as you mentioned there in your report, the former president has made such an issue of this thing with the passports. Do we know how they got mixed up in this? Well, Tommy, you also even today said thank you to the federal government. So add that into all of this. But an official familiar with what happened tells me that when items are seized, they are sorted before they go to investigators. And if there are things found that are unrelated to the case, and that could be personal items like the passports, they are returned. And based on this example being made public, we know another detail that we didn't know before. And that is that, that at least some of the evidence that was seized in Florida has now been moved here to Washington, D.C. Tom? All right, Kelly O again for, for us from the White House. Kelly, thank you for that. Staying on that FBI investigation, the former president's former national security advisor, John Bolton, spoke exclusively to NBC News and shed some new light on Trump's treatment of state secrets, saying the president was known to take and keep classified documents and that Bolton was concerned by this. He spoke to NBC's national security correspondent, Ken Delanian. Mr. Trump, can we have a word, sir? Tonight, exclusive new details about how classified documents may have ended up at Mar-a-Lago. The president had a habit of asking to retain sensitive documents. And from time to time, uh, he did that, and we didn't know what happened to them. And it was always a concern that uh, because he didn't really fully understand the risks to sources and methods, uh, and other dangers of uh, revealing classified information that it might get out to the wrong people. Donald Trump's former national security advisor speaking exclusively to NBC News about what he says was the former president's penchant for hoarding secret records. A week after court records showed the FBI seized highly classified documents at Trump's Florida compound, John Bolton says Trump made clear he wanted to keep certain documents for himself, regardless of classification. Frequently, the briefers were reluctant to bring documents that they thought the president might ask to keep. Other former senior Trump aides telling NBC News the president's approach to presidential records was slapdash and ad hoc, and he had little regard for state secrets. Trump once tweeted out what Bolton and a former senior intelligence official say was a highly classified photo of a damaged Iranian missile site. And, as NBC News reported at the time, provided classified information to Russian officials in the Oval Office. Three former officials with first-hand knowledge said Trump would regularly show uncleared people a highly classified set of letters he exchanged with the North Korean leader. Multiple former officials said the president also had a habit of ripping up records that aides would have to retrieve from trash cans and tape back together. The former officials tell NBC News that when Trump finally realized he was leaving office, he ordered aides to stuff documents in banker boxes to be taken to his Florida compound. One person who was there told NBC News it was a chaotic exit and that both staff and movers piled everything into the moving trucks. When they got to Mar-a-Lago, they piled everything there in this storage room, except for things like the First Lady's clothes. Everything in the box went there. A Trump spokesman rejecting the criticism, and Trump now saying everything he took home with him was declassified. But experts say that's not the case. They note that even when Trump proclaimed records declassified while he was president, the rest of the government didn't always agree. We were asking for records relating to Carter Page and the FISA warrants applications that were underway. And at one point, the White House via Trump had issued a press release. I think he had tweeted about it as well to say, well, I'm going to declassify this information. And that was rejected by the judge here in Washington, D.C., in federal court. 
saying that 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 was not sufficient as proof of declassification. Even if Trump is right, experts say, the records were the property of the U.S. government. Why they were in Trump's Mar-a-Lago compound is now the crux of the Justice Department's investigation. All right. Ken joins us now from uh, our nation's capital. Ken, a lot of new reporting there and shedding light on a lot of questions I think people have. But one of the big mysteries here is is how former President Trump or, or those around him were able to get classified documents out of the White House. Wouldn't there be, or you would think, there'd be systems in place to make sure sensitive material was accounted for? Tom, John Bolton and other former senior national security officials put it this way. Donald Trump didn't pack those boxes on his own. He had help. There are supposed to be guardrails around classified documents, and clearly something broke down here. The Justice Department appears now to be investigating how that happened, who was involved, and whether they are criminally culpable. Tom? All right, Ken Delanian for us live from Washington. Ken, we thank you for that. We want to head overseas now to new signs that Ukraine is on the offensive against Russia. Both sides in the ongoing war shifting troops to the southern region of Ukraine with Russian forces facing unexpected setbacks in a territory they've long held control of. Josh Letterman reports tonight from Kyiv. An ammunition depot exploded in Russian-occupied Crimea early this morning. The second suspected Ukrainian attack there in a week. Russia's military called it sabotage. Ukraine's military didn't take credit publicly, but did say the explosion makes us all happy. In Moscow, President Putin blamed U.S. weapons for fueling the war, saying Washington is trying to prolong the conflict, even as Ukraine's President Zelensky accuses Putin of nuclear blackmail amid near-daily shelling of Europe's largest nuclear power plant. For weeks, Ukraine's leaders have been promising a counteroffensive to drive Russian forces out of the south. Who right now is winning this war? There have been ebbs and flows in this war. I would say that the, uh, the Ukrainians have probably seized the initiative. Today, we spoke with retired Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Vindman in Kyiv. He's the Ukrainian-American former White House official who blew the whistle on former President Trump's infamous phone call with Zelensky. It was my duty to report. And took center stage in Trump's first impeachment. We could have helped make this a short war. Vindman is now calling out President Biden, saying the U.S. should be doing more faster. It's frustrating to watch the U.S. take this very incremental approach. Should the U.S. be providing fighter jets to Ukraine? I think we should be training and preparing the Ukrainians to, to take fighter jets. If we become fatigued, we set the conditions for a, a Russian victory. All right, Josh Letterman joins us now. Josh, we saw there in your story, you spent some time with Lieutenant Colonel Vindman. What exactly is he doing in Kyiv? Well, he's here meeting with top Ukrainian officials, as well as U.S. officials from the State Department, the U.S. Embassy and the Defense Department. He says he wants to get a firsthand understanding about the state of the war here and also wants to keep this issue in the spotlight because he says U.S. fatigue about the Ukraine war could potentially set the table for a Russian victory, Tom. So I have to ask, you know, he was even critical of President Biden there. Is he acting in, in a, basically a personal capacity or is he working with, with any other groups? He's working in his personal capacity. He has a charity group that he has also uh, been developing that is doing work on the ground here. But he is really leveraging his name as possibly the most famous Ukrainian American to try to bring more attention to the issue here, as well as to advocate for a more forceful U.S. response to helping Ukraine stand up to Russia. And Josh, I know you also have some new reporting tonight about those grain ships we've been talking weeks about. That's right. The first ship carrying humanitarian aid to Africa has now left Ukrainian ports. Uh, it is called Brave Commander, and it is carrying 23,000 tons of wheat, as well as fresh hope to countries in Africa and elsewhere that are very concerned about that looming food crisis, Tom. All right, Josh Letterman from Key for us tonight. Josh, we appreciate it. Back here at home, we've been telling you about the mega drought hitting the western U.S. The federal government today taking drastic measures, announcing water cuts in two states. And they may not end there. Here's Miguel Almaguer. 
In the grips of a prolonged and historic drought, tonight the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation announcing unprecedented water cuts to states along the Colorado River, the lifeblood of the American West, serving some 40 million people. Facing a tier two shortage for the first time in history, authorities say in January, Arizona will lose 21 percent of its yearly water allocation from the river as Nevada loses 8 percent. It's complex problems, not only in natural resources, but politically, economically, socially. Climate change has only intensified a 23-year mega drought in the now critically low water levels, snaking from the Rocky Mountains through the parched southwest. The river water sustains some of the largest cities in the country, but some 80 percent is used to grow produce that feeds the nation. We must be conscious of the fact that we deal with finite resources and we need to to manage accordingly. Downriver, Lake Powell and Lake Mead are just a quarter full. Hydropower production could soon be threatened. Today's water cuts made by the federal government come after the seven states involved couldn't reach an agreement on their own. Future cuts impacting even more states seem inevitable. Hoping to avoid a catastrophic river collapse, Arizona and Nevada face a tightening tap, a crisis threatening to trickle down to more of the country. Miguel Almaguer, NBC News. And those and that worsening drought out west also creating new mysteries. Lake Mead is at its lowest level in more than 80 years. Authorities have discovered human remains, some of them in barrels with bullet holes to the head. It's left many to wonder if the receding waters have unearthed decades old mob hits. Here's Maggie Vespa. Tonight, a mystery deepening in Nevada with human remains discovered at Lake Mead four times since May. Authorities say the finds are still under investigation, but among locals, questions about ties to Sin City's notoriously violent mafia mount. It all started May 1st when boaters on the Las Vegas area reservoir discovered a body in a barrel with authorities say a gunshot wound to the head. They added the victim wore outdated clothes, likely killed in the 70s or 80s. This was a methodology to dispose of a body. Jeff Schumacher, vice president of the Mob Museum in Las Vegas, immediately took notice. So that's, that's not just Hollywood folklore. That actually happened. It's definitely not just Hollywood. And we found dozens and dozens of cases where uh, bodies were stuffed into barrels and disposed of in various ways all over the country, actually all over the world, dating back to the mid 1800s. Among the top theories, that first body in the barrel may have been put there by a notorious mob enforcer, Tony the Ant Spilatro, or his crew. Spilatro, the inspiration for Joe Pesci's character in Casino. What people would you think I wasn't gonna find out? Spilatro moved to Las Vegas in the early 70s, heading the so-called Hole in the Wall Gang. The FBI, Schumacher says, traced 25 murders to Spilatro during the 70s and 80s. A violent chapter of America's past with a potential new layer lurking beneath a lake's surface. I don't think very many people ever thought about, you know, dredging Lake Mead to look for, for mob victims. It just wasn't something that uh, came up until this barrel was discovered. Less than a week after that first find, on May 7th, another barrel, another body. This time on the shoreline, police have yet to make the mob connection. Cut to July, discovery number three, more remains on a popular beach. Again, officials say that cause of death, like this latest set of remains found, is still a mystery. They keep on calling me up, Oscar, who did it? I said, well, how am I supposed to know who did it? I didn't order it, I'll tell you that. Former Las Vegas mayor Oscar Goodman, who represented mob figures as a lawyer, spoke with our affiliate KNSV back in May. I tried a lot of cases. I tried quite a few cases where there were allegations that my clients, uh, some, a lot, um, shot people. What is clear? The reason these remains are surfacing now. Amid record drought, Lake Mead, which sits 30 miles east of Sin City, is rapidly receding, now at its lowest levels since 1937 when it was first filled. The shrinking lake revealing potentially dark secrets. All right, Maggie Vespa joins us now live from Chicago. Maggie, this is truly a fascinating story. Now, we mentioned you're in Chicago there, a city with infamous mafia history and a possible tie, right. as our expert pointed out, to this story. Why does he think there could be a connection to that infamous Chicago mobster depicted in Casino? Right. Well, because basically during the 70s and 80s, the mob was everywhere. I mean, yes, Chicago has a history. Vegas has a history. But it was in several cities across the country, and they were all 
interconnected. And this might shock you, but uh, Schumacher basically said that mob, sort of mobsters and lead mobsters in Chicago had a strong interest in developing ties with Las Vegas casinos. So that's obviously one theory there. He also has a theory, by the way, as to who the victim in that first barrel might be, including a hotel manager who had mafia ties, also had a boat on Lake Mead and went missing at the time. But there are several theories out there as to who these different people are. And you can bet a lot of people will be watching to see the identities of these victims who are now turning up. Tom. All right. Maggie Vespa with a lot of interesting reporting for us tonight. Maggie, we appreciate it. Still ahead tonight, where is Kylie Rodney? The new developments in that search for a California teen now missing for 11 days. Her last cell phone ping and the massive reward now being offered for information. Plus, the incredible new video showing a group of strangers working together to rescue a driver after a rollover crash. And the massive fight breaking out between two NFL teams during training camp. Did you hear about this? The punishments then handed down. Stay with us. Top story just getting started on this Tuesday. All right, we are back now with the search for 16-year-old Kylie Rodney, who disappeared more than a week ago after leaving a party near Lake Tahoe. Her friends and family desperate for information as investigators comb through thousands of tips for any new leads. NBC's Maya Eaglin has new developments in that search. Tonight, the search for missing California teenager Kylie Rodney enters a new phase after 11 days. We are going to have to uh, switch modes and, and kind of focus on the investigative end and try to figure out where do we go from there. The Placer County Sheriff's Office telling NBC News it's stopping search and rescue efforts for now until the investigation turns up new leads. The Rodney family upping the reward for information listed on findkylie.com to $75,000. The 16-year-old was attending a party with hundreds of others at a campground near Lake Tahoe on Friday, August 5th, when she was last seen around midnight. Her phone, last pinged around 12.30 a.m. Saturday morning, according to police, showed her location near Prosser Lake, in the vicinity of the party. Investigators believe the phone ran out of battery or was shut off. Her mother recounting the last conversation she had with Kylie. I asked her to wake me up when she got home, like she always does, and she said, okay, and thanks, Mama, love you. And that's the last I ever heard from her. And Kylie's father sharing this message. Extremely concerned. I, this is it's an absolute nightmare. This is every parent's nightmare. Now, no trace of Kylie or the silver Honda she drove to the campground in. Police releasing several photos of Rodney, including this one taken just hours before the party, and this photo of the hoodie she's said to have been wearing when last seen. Police saying they received a video of her in that sweatshirt at the party, but have not released it yet. Uh, if anyone has more video that they have not submitted, please, there's no small amount of information for us. Kylie's best friend Magdalene, who's assisting the search, spoke to our Sacramento affiliate. I just want her to come back and be okay and just to know that she's loved. Over the weekend, Rodney's hometown of Truckee, California, coming together for a concert in her honor. Country for Kylie is about hope. Yeah, playing that first. It is about community. And I'm not it is about heart. keeping our spirits high. And all right, Maya Eaglin joins Top Story now live tonight. So, Maya, you know, I want to talk about the car and the area where this happened. We know it's north of Lake Tahoe. Talk to us. Is it mountainous? Is, is it woodsy? It's a lot of forest. It's a very popular destination for people to do boating, swimming, fishing, camping. There's a lot of wildlife around, and it's a super popular area for college students and high schoolers to come and hang out. And, and police have searched the entire, they've searched all of the area around that campground, correct? Yes, we're hearing they've searched the water, they've used helicopters, they've searched on foot and they're telling people that you can still volunteer to look on your own time just to be safe about it. And, and, and no sign of this, of this teenager and also no sign of her car. What do we know about the people that were at the party? Kylie herself is 16. We know the other people there were likely high schoolers, maybe even college students. Officials are fearful that because there might have been underage drinking or underage drug use, some people might be fearful to come forward with information. But they're saying it's more important to share anything that will get them closer to finding Kylie. Okay, Maya Eaglin with a, a lot of new reporting for us. Maya, we do appreciate that. For more on how authorities may be working to locate Kylie, I want to bring in Bill Stanton. He's a safety and security expert and the author of Prepared, Not Scared, Your Go to guide for staying safe in an unsafe world. So, Bill, you, you, you heard Maya's reporting there, as we just heard. She was at a party with more than 200 people. Someone must have seen something. Should police be zeroing in on witnesses at this next phase? 
Tom, you, you hit it right on the head. You have 200 people, mostly teenagers. These kids today, they're putting everything on TikTok and social media. She may be in the background. They should all be searching their phones, the pictures and videos they've taken. You never know that person that may have been stalking her could be in the background or she may have left with friends. So, Bill, well, you mentioned someone stalking her. Do you think this is an abduction? Do you, do you think something nefarious happened to this, this young woman? Well, that's a tough one to answer. Right now, they're going to be combing through her social media footprint. They're going to be talking to the friends and family. Was she depressed? Could this possibly be a runaway? Uh, did she have a boyfriend? Could they have run away? Did she come alone? And usually at these parties, these teenage girls, they come in the pack and they leave in the pack. You know, uh, as was mentioned, was there drug use? Could she have unknowingly taken a drug? And could someone have taken her and the car away from the location? Yeah, I, I, that, that seems to stand out to me that they haven't been able to locate her vehicle as well. You know, we, we know just from television and, and from so much crime reporting that's done that the first 48 hours are so important. This case seems to have gone cold. How difficult is it now for investigators? We're talking about, you know, several days out from when this happened. Well, hopefully they're not telling us everything they know and they're tightening that circle. Whether it's something, uh, a text message, a phone call, or a reluctant witness that have given them uh, information that they're not ready to release. Because there is so much here by way of log logistics. Over 200 potential witnesses. Then you have the family. It's a huge hill to climb. And hopefully law enforcement with the public will get to the bottom of this very soon. A big reward right now, 16-year-old Kylie Rodney still missing. All right, Bill Stanton, we always appreciate your time. When we come back, the highway inferno, the Walmart truck, engulfed in flames, shutting down both sides of traffic for hours. So what happened here? Take a look at that, we'll tell you. Stay with us. All right, we are back now with Top Stories News Feed, and we begin with the fiery tractor trailer crash in North Carolina. Video shows the Walmart truck engulfed in flames on I-77 in Charlotte. Authorities say the driver crashed into a concrete barrier. He was taken to the hospital, but he is expected to be okay. The highway was shut down in both directions for several hours, but has since reopened. A group of strangers in Texas came together to help a driver after a rollover crash. This cell phone video shows nearly a dozen good Samaritans, right, working together to turn that car over. It happened on a highway in San Antonio. The man filming told our San Antonio affiliate, W. OAI that he witnessed the crash and flagged down others to help because his hand was broken. The driver was conscious when he first responders first arrived and is recovering at the hospital. Okay, and a rocky start to joint practices between the New England Patriots and the Carolina Panthers. Take a look. New video shows a massive brawl breaking out between both teams. Players even throwing punches. Several players then ejected. Another fight also broke out later in the day. The teams are hosting a joint training camp in Foxborough, Massachusetts, before playing a preseason game Friday at Gillette Stadium. It looks like they're ready to play. And the FDA has given the green light for over-the-counter adult hearing aids. This means millions of Americans who suffer from hearing loss will be able to get the devices without a prescription or even a doctor's visit. President Biden today saying it could lower the price of a pair by nearly $3,000. They're expected to be available online and in drugstores by October. All right, now to Money Talks. Our focus tonight on a grim headline on the housing market. The chief economist for the National Association of Home Builders declaring we've entered a housing recession, citing rising construction costs and Federal Reserve policy. That declaration coming with builder confidence dropping for the eighth straight month. You see this graph right here. The index now falling into negative territory for the first time since the start of the pandemic. And Compass, one of the country's largest real estate brokerages, reporting a loss of more than $100 million in the last quarter alone. Joining us now is CNBC real estate correspondent Diana Olick. So Diana, are we in a housing recession? Well, when you look at it, Tom, from the builder's perspective, they're taking in a lot of different data points. Number one, like you said, home builder confidence dropping for eight straight months. Then we saw new home sales in June plummet to well below healthy levels. We're also seeing the cancellation rates for new home sales rise dramatically, literally doubling since April. And finally, today we got a report on single family home construction. It dropped again, down 10 percent month over month, over 18 percent from a year ago. And the prediction is now 
now that in 2022, we will see lower home construction for single family homes for the first time annually since 2011. And that, when you put it all together, means a housing recession. Okay, so I do have to ask you, though, is, is there any upside to this whatsoever? Could this finally bring some prices down, especially those sky high prices, or is the inventory still very low? Well, the inventory is still very low and demand is still high, even though people are sitting on the sidelines because they're concerned about affordability, they're concerned about the economy, inflation. There is still demand out there. As for prices, the home builders said in this same survey that some were lowering prices on average about 5%. Is 5% a lot? No, not when we see new home prices up over 20% from a year ago and up over 30% just since the start of the pandemic. The same thing is happening in the existing home market. Prices are easing. That is, you're not seeing the bidding wars that we were seeing just barely six months ago. But prices can't come down that much given the gains that we've already seen. So will they perhaps flatten for a while, go up maybe 1% or 2% or even come down 1%? Perhaps. But we're not going to see meaningful changes in home prices simply because, as you say, Tom, it's that supply and demand, still too low supply, still high demand. And I know you've done a lot of reporting on this. More and more home buyers are backing out of deals. We've seen a lot of headlines over the last few weeks about this. What's driving the exodus? Is it the increasing mortgage rates? It's actually twofold. So number one, you're right on the mortgage rates. Some people simply don't qualify anymore. So when you're buying a newly built home, you put your deposit down or you make that agreement with the builder well before they may even have started building the home. So it could be six, eight, nine months, even a year before you're going to close on that home. And you've qualified for the mortgage maybe six months ago when rates were around 3%. Now they're five and a half percent. Some buyers are simply not qualifying for those loans anymore. So they have to pull out or the builders are canceling the deals themselves. Others are saying, you know what, wait, I'm nervous. I don't like this. I might be catching a falling knife on home prices. This isn't a good investment for me anymore. So they're pulling out. And it depends on the type of deal or state to state whether they're going to get their deposits back or not. Finally, Diana, since I have you, rent prices also out of control in so many cities. Is there any relief in sight for people who are renting? Well, in that home construction report this morning, we did see for multifamily a little bit better news. Not great, but a little better. The question is, are they building affordable housing units in multifamily or is it still on the luxury end? A lot of it is still on the higher end, which could bring rents down in big cities, perhaps, but not in the affordable housing that we really need. The problem, again, is that the builders are under inflation as well. Higher prices for land, labor, materials. They simply can't pencil affordable housing right now. And so they are keeping rents high. All right, Diana Olick for us, Diana. We do appreciate it. Now to Top Stories Global Watch and the violent protests in Kenya following the country's presidential election. New video showing police firing tear gas at protesters as they set fires and block roads in the port city of Kisimu. The protests erupting after the deputy president was declared the winner of a tight presidential race there. His challenger has rejected those results and vowed a challenge in court. And in the Americas, Ecuador has declared another state of emergency after a deadly gang bombing. An explosion in Guayaquil over the weekend killed at least five people and injured more than a dozen others. Look at that. The country's president now sending armed forces into the port city after saying the attack was a, quote, declaration of war by gangs there and declared it a terrorist act. All right, coming up, danger in the water. A 10-year-old boy bitten off the coast of Florida and airlifted to the hospital. It's the latest in a string of attacks this summer, so are they becoming more common? We'll be right back. All right, we are back now with more shark attacks causing alarm for beachgoers. A little boy in Florida getting bit by a bull shark and emergency teams having to airlift him to the hospital. Stephen Romo has more. Tonight, shark attacks raising fears from coast to coast. One of the latest serious incidents causing a 10-year-old boy to lose part of his leg after a bull shark attack, according to his family. The Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission confirming the boy was bitten while snorkeling at Lou Key Reef. His uncle posting on Facebook that Jameson Jr. took a crushing blow near his knee from an eight-foot bull shark. His family placing a tourniquet on his leg to stop the bleeding. He was then airlifted to the hospital where his leg was amputated just below the knee to save his life. The fundraising page for the family raising more than $50,000 in donations in just two days. This is at least the third shark attack in South Florida in less than a month. We're 
we're out at Sawyer Key on a boat. My wife just got bit by a shark. Her leg is fat. Lindsey Bruns and her daughters jumped off a pontoon boat while on vacation from Texas when her husband saw splashing and, quote, nothing but blood in the water. Is she bleeding right now? Do you have a towel wrapped around her leg? I do. We tied it off. Doctors weren't sure if they were going to be able to save her leg, but are now hopeful that she will gain back most of her function. Nearby at Daytona Beach Shores, Tasha Summers was bitten in the shin by a small shark. My first instinct was just to scream. And just a few days ago, a shark attacked David Stickler in Pacific Grove, California, while he was paddleboarding with his dog. Grabbed onto the front of the board and hit it hard, and that was really jarring. This encounter coming just two months after another man was bitten by a shark in that same area, suffering major injuries to his stomach and leg, according to city officials. And it grabbed me and pulled me up and then dove me down in the water. And then, it, of course, it spit me out. Multiple shark attacks this summer off the coast of Long Island, too, including two in one day. With summer still in full force, Experts say it's a little too soon to gauge whether these attacks are part of an increasing trend. While still rare, shark attacks jumped after 2020, at least in part because people are now back at beaches after pandemic closures had many canceling vacations. All right, Stephen joins us now in studio. Stephen, I, I can't stop thinking about that little boy. Do we, do we know what he's doing tonight? Yeah, well, his uncle actually says that Jameson Jr. is out of surgery and he's resting. He's just trying to grasp what happened to him. As you can imagine, a 10-year-old takes some time to figure out exactly how he's going to live now. His aunt's also telling us that his 11th birthday is just a few weeks away. So right now, he's going to celebrate that he's alive and recovering and also has that birthday to celebrate, Tom. All right, Stephen Romo with that update for us tonight. Stephen, we thank you for that. For more on these recent shark attacks and whether or not we're actually seeing more of them this year, I want to bring in biologist, wildlife conservationist, and the host of Wildlife Nation, Jeff Corwin. Jeff, thanks so much for joining Top Story tonight. So we heard there in Stephen's piece, South Florida has seen three attacks in less than a month. And while the pandemic might have accounted for a bump in the attacks last year, do, do scientists know why we're seeing more this year? Well, we are seeing an increase in complex situations with sharks because we're seeing more sharks, especially where I live in New England. I'm like in the hot zone for sharks right off of Cape Cod. I live in a little island. And because around here we have a healthier environment, we've had an increase in prey species like uh, seals, like gray seals and harbor seals. And because of good conservation laws and also because of climate change, sharks are moving more northerly. We're seeing an increase in sharks, which increases, although remotely, a probability of having a problem. In Florida, it's the same scenario. We have uh, bumper crops of uh, black tip and bull sharks and tiger sharks. And with more sharks, sharing this valuable real estate that coastal environments of beautiful Florida were more likely to run in, into a, a problem. You know, you mentioned Florida. That's where I'm from. And I've spoken to a lot of commercial fishermen there, charter fishermen, who have said the shark conservation programs have actually worked, they believe, because they're seeing a lot more sharks. They call them the tax man down there because they take a lot of their fish. I was going to ask you, at what point do we know if there are too many sharks or are we not even near that area just yet? That's a great question, Tom. And that's the million dollar question. Actually, for the fishing industry, that's the that's probably the two billion dollar question in Florida because recreational and commercial fisheries is so important there. I'm an avid and passionate fisherman myself. So it, it, it's complicated. So yes, we are seeing an increase in a number of sharks, but also sharks are becoming more concentrated because a number of the areas where they would traditionally survive are uh, these, these habitats are no longer healthy enough. For example, you're from Florida, how much of Florida's coral reef survives today? And that's the question. See if you could guess. It, it, I have no idea, but I, I know where you're going with this. 2%. Yeah. 2%. So the, the, the shark species that you see in Florida, like uh, hammerheads, uh, black tips, bull sharks, and all the other incredible species, bonnet heads, they often have a strong connection to the reef system there. In fact, 70% of all the species of fish in Florida have a connection in some way, somehow, to our coral reef. So when we see that environment impacted, sharks tend to transition to other places. 
Overall, though, Tom, in the United States, sharks are doing much better than they are in other parts of the world, especially great white sharks, which we have around here. And for those folks who are nervous about being in the water with the shark, uh, what I like to tell them is you have a better chance of winning the lottery winning the lottery twice than being attacked by a shark. And in that same note, I don't know if this is comforting, but if you're ever in the water in Florida or in New England and it's a healthy body of water, you're never more than two or 300 feet away from a wild shark. Yeah, and so I want to ask you about that because we've also seen some wild videos this summer as well, especially, I think, with the proliferation of drone cameras. We've just kind of seen sharks more in their element closer to the coast. I was going to ask you what tips have you had for, for swimmers there because we've seen the attacks at least this summer happen really everywhere. Uh, kids snorkeling, families at the beach, people swimming. What, what tips do you have for, for people out there? Great question. So there's nothing more catastrophic than being bitten by a shark. Even a small shark, an average bite uh, when it's in predatory mode, it takes about five pounds of flesh. So it's significant. You can be comforted to know that that is so remote and that is so rare. I've actually sat on balconies in hotels, for example, in, ha- in Hawaii, look down at the beach where I'm about to scuba dive for a TV show. And I literally can see thousands of plump, um, uh, overly roasted from the sun tourists bobbing in the water surrounded by sharks and the sharks are doing nothing. They're ignoring them. Human beings are, uh, we are typically not on the menu for sharks. Oftentimes when you get a bite, especially in places like Florida, it's a test bite. So what's yeah. causing that test bite? It's confusion. It's mistaken identity. It's swimming when there's a lot of turbidity in the water, when the when the visibility in the water is really low, it's really murky. It's after rainstorms. It's when you have high concentration of sharks because of breeding or pupping seasons, or it's during low levels of light, like sunrise or sunset. Those are the times where that remote opportunity of having a conflict with a shark ticks up just a little bit. But it's incredibly remote. It's incredibly rare. We also know that sharks are critical to our environment. They are keystone species. And to define a healthy ecosystem in a marine environment, you need to have sharks there. Yeah. Jeff Corwin for us tonight here on Top Story. Jeff, it was a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you so much. And tight lines to you as you're out there on the boat, hopefully catching some fish uh, and bringing them home. Thanks so much. Coming up, (laughs) coming up, meet the greatest great grandmother. She just welcomed her 100th great grandchild and she's about to turn 100 years old. The family picture you have to see to believe. Stay with us. All right, finally tonight, one very big family celebrating an even bigger milestone. A 99-year-old woman from the Philadelphia suburbs just met her 100th, that's right, her 100th great-grandchild. And that's not the only thing this family is celebrating. Here's Kristen Dahlgren with more. So that's Kohler William, Grandma. Newborn baby Kohler, meet your great-grandma Marguerite Kohler. She knows a thing or two about kids. I think we'll leave him with you. <laughs> That's a good idea. <laughs> you know what you're doing. Huh? You yeah. know what you're doing. In the Kohler clan, great grandma has quite the legacy. 11 children, 56 grandchildren, and then 100 great grandchildren. <laughs> One ginormous family, all started by a woman who grew up as an only child. She was married to my grandfather right before World War II in 1942. Um, and they were happily married for 66 years. Baby Kohler named to honor his Grandma Kohler and Grandpa William. And it felt very natural to name him Kohler and William as the middle name. And then we can always call him Cole if we like. And his place as the 100th grandchild, extra special, because another 100 milestone is coming up. So you're going to be 100 years old soon and the 100th great-grandchild. So with 100 great-grandchildren, 56 grandchildren, and 11 children, it's safe to say hosting Thanksgiving isn't just an event, it's a village gathering. And we just come in different heats <laughs> and make our presents and you know spend some time together and then we disperse so that everyone can kind of get together at these critical points throughout the year. Adding all four generations up, that's 168 Kohler family members. For the newest member, that's going to be a lot of names to learn. My grandmother's name is Marguerite. She named my mother Marguerite. 
who named my oldest sister Marguerite, and then my brother's my second daughter is Marguerite as well. But for the OG Marguerite... Does he make you happy? Oh my God, yeah. Hmm. I'm just thinking how lucky I am. <laughs> That feeling of happiness from holding every great-grandkid never gets old. Kristen Dahlgren, NBC News. A hundred great-grandkids. That's a lot of birthday gifts. All right, we thank Kristen Dahlgren for that story, and we thank you for watching Top Story tonight. I'm Tom Yamas in New York. Stay right there. More news on the way.